Hare Krishna Sutava Pro. Welcome to the Monks yes. podcast. It's Thank you wonderful. so much for having me. <laughs> Now it's wonderful to be with you once again when I visit London I look forward to your association. And you know the first time I heard about you was when I read your book on the Bhagavad Gita with the acronyms. And since then uh, as you have interacted I've seen that you know you have a very you have, you have been able to present bhakti wisdom in a very creative and accessible way and um, so maybe i i thought today we'll talk about this you know, not just like making bhakti wisdom accessible and applicable in people's lives what is required for that so we could start with a little bit about your background how did you come to the point of uh, doing this particular service mm-hmm. how were you introduced and sure i um i grew up not too far away from bhaktivedanta mana so i was exposed to the tradition from a young age but uh, my interest grew over time at university and when i was 21 then i um decided to take some time out after graduating and i came to chopati india for 6 months and spent some time there this was which and year? then i what me which year was this roughly this was in 2002 oh, okay. um yeah so i spent 6 months there at that time and uh, and then when i came back i decided to take a little bit more time out and uh as years went by um i i remained in the brahmacharya ashram so i've been here just yeah coming up to 20 years now at the manor and um yeah it's been a, an amazing journey and learning so much and uh, yeah we'll hopefully be able to share some of those things today so were you one of the pioneers of the pandav seva because there is this whole program of sabbatical and devotees coming here so were you one of the first batches in that Yeah, the Pandava Sena were uh, formed when uh, the Bhaktivedanta Manor was potentially being closed down. So that was in uh, kind of around 1996, around that time. Um, and uh, that that's when I first came in contact with the devotees. Um, and I became, I guess, a bit more of a serious practitioner later on um, and was involved in Pandava Sena. But I wasn't a batch of the first pioneers, but I, I I was around at that time uh, yeah okay and uh, you have been so when you came there was there already a vibrant program for training youth whether they become brahmacharis or they become congregation or that grew over the years Yeah what happened is we the Pandava Sena were vibrant active in many areas they were um sharing Krishna consciousness at many universities and they would have local programs um but at that time no one from the Pandava Sena was really uh having ashram training that tradition had not uh, begun and what we did in 2002 is we began a program called the sabbatical where they could take 6 months out after their university and experience ashram life and then go back uh, either into the world or remain in the ashram and so we began that program and over the last 20 years I, i guess we've had in the region of something between 150 to 200 devotees who have taken 6 months out like that um and and it's become yeah a bit more of a tradition now for everyone if when they get the opportunity to have some time in absorbed krishna consciousness as as an experience with the potential for a few for it to become more long term oh okay so <clears throat> so in one sense if if i consider the london temple and the whole project in london that's probably the one of the most successful models of uh, outreach that we have in the western world and um, of course i would say as our movement has evolved while the manor is a place where you have the ashram and you have devotees residing but around that you also have a quite a vibrant community so <clears throat> when you came in at that time uh, and since the years onwards that have passed 
you know we can see clearly i think in india it's evident in the west also it's evident that we are at a moment at a time when devotees may come into the temple and stay in the temple for some time i think that's happening probably in the in there in manner maybe a little bit in krishna house in america but otherwise most devotees are likely to be congregation devotees so yeah for sure that's what we've experienced over the years um i think when we were young brahmachais when we had just joined we had a dream that all the young devotees would join the temple and would be bursting at the seams and um over years we realized that uh perhaps that was a little immature and uh having an experience of ashram life for some period is uh wonderful is empowering is very edifying for devotees but yeah the vast majority will uh, live in the congregation will have a family and a job and uh and hopefully still practice krishna consciousness so yeah we we've seen that um and i think one kind of if i look at my 20 years here at the manor then i can almost make a very clear divide of my first 10 years and my second 10 years and my first 10 years were very much about um developing the brahmachari ashram about traveling and preaching um distributing books around the country uh very much about um speaking at programs so it was very much a uh, a kind of more of a outreach program we were planting a lot of seeds and that that was my experience of sharing krishna consciousness we had a um, we had a goal to try and do one day of book distribution in every single town in the uk so we would oh. almost hop from town to town and try to do at least one full day of book distribution and 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 cover every single town in the uk it was kind of an aspiration <laughs> that's quite and, you're, you're able to do that um there's about 560 kind of towns of a certain size within the uk so we got that list and managed to do about 380 so that's still huge yeah i get yeah, think of so, you know, the youthful energy that must have driven that kind of ambition <laughs> yeah it was kind of you know it was an adventure going out there almost like a spiritual kind of army squad you know jumping out of the van doing a day of book distribution packing it all up and then just traveling to the next place and so it was a lot of planting seeds and i think that was very nice that was very wonderful it was a great experience for us and um and what happened is that towards the end of those first 10 years we began to realize that it's nice to plant many seeds and it's nice to give people an initial exposure to krishna consciousness but then uh we also really have to care and cultivate and um uh walk with them along the journey of krishna consciousness so i think my second 10 years very much kind of yeah were a contrast you know in these 10 last 10 years i've been doing a lot more uh with the community a lot more with um cultivating counseling um uh, trying to care for devotees i've had a lot more experience in terms of brahmacharis making a transition from being in the ashram to going into the community and helping them with that transition um a lot more to do with education uh we began something called school of bhakti uh where we kind of do systematic courses educating so it, it was very nice th- those two aspects um of uh i guess broad aspects of sharing krishna consciousness the almost the quantitative um going out there and giving pe- as many people as much contact as possible and then the more qualitative of actually then trying to really um help those individuals in a in a very personal way to practice spiritual life that's beautiful you know, you know when you're speaking this i was also thinking about my life my first it is not exactly similar but that that idea of mm-hmm. dividing into i've been out from my 24 23 24 years now for the first 10 years i was also very much centered on youth at outreach 
travel to various youth outreach programs and do outreach and help in the essentially the building of the brahmacharya ashram with youth outreach but then after that it's almost like entirely i have started traveling abroad and traveling abroad means mostly it's congregation outreach and uh, it's almost like when your service changes uh, even our definition of what krishna consciousness is changes we understand krishna consciousness many aspects but still so we depending on the service that we are doing we perceive krishna consciousness in particular ways with particular priorities particular emphasis so i think that's why uh, for you once you started training doing courses and uh, whenever i have been to uk also i have seen that you have a culture of uh, systematic courses and education which we don't have many parallels in the world i think apart from mih uih you must be you know, one of the pioneers for doing systematic courses isn't it yeah uh, i mean systematic education in the uk has been going on for many years we're blessed with many disciples of shila prabhupad who uh, who are incredible educators and therefore there were different programs over the years at the manor there was something called manor training and education then there was the college of vedic studies then there is now the school of bhakti so in the uk it's definitely uh, and the manor in particular it's been um uh something which has been developed over over uh, many years and decades and mm. uh, such a valuable program but just coming back to one of your points we were about when our service changes and how our vision of krishna consciousness changes i remember one of the most defining points in uh changing my perspective or evolving my perspective of krishna consciousness was when i began to work with one group of devotees um and i worked with them for 2 years Now what had happened is for many years you know Friday Saturday and Sunday were almost like the preaching days um <laughs> at the manor so there would be a circuit of programs and what we do is every week we just do the circuit so it would mean you know you go to a different sangha every week and uh, you you give a class keep try to give some inspiration and then you do the next one and the next one and by the time you've done the circuit you come back to the first one after three or four months and then begin again and like this it was just doing many many programs and many many classes and that was very satisfying in in many ways because devotees appreciated the inspiration and we felt as though we were meeting many different people and sharing but then what happened is uh, some devotees suggested why don't you work with one group of people for two years and meet them every single week and for me that was kind of a revolutionary concept because i thought just one group of people 20 people just every week but i can contact so many people they said no it, it may it may be a edifying experience for you and so i began with 20 individuals meeting them every week and then naturally it becomes more than giving a class you kind of understand what's going on in their life not only do you understand what what's going on in their life they begin to share their obstacles their issues their difficulties with you and what happened over those 2 years is i think more than ever before it began to occur to me how much someone has to go through in order to become a devotee of krishna and um I think previously in my life I had never really appreciated that. I here I was a brahmachari living in the ashram it's pretty straightforward in one sense you have a program and I would go out and I would tell people to do the same thing. And uh in my mind it was very simple just follow the process. But only when I actually began getting involved with devotees then I realized how much more there is to develop a uh awakening krishna consciousness in others how much more it is than just giving a class there's so much more to it hmm. that's fascinating so in one sense what we are talking about is uh, 
not just giving the information or the uh, the intellectual inputs that's what we do by giving classes to help people become krishna conscious but then there is a whole set of uh, other supports that are required so i also realized that actually when you get off the vyasasana and talk with people at a one to one level they learn so much more about what they are thinking what they are going through so so in one sense if we consider the traditional situation in india you know people had a whole supportive community that helped them to be spiritual so what are the dimensions that you feel are required say to apart from giving classes and how how have you worked on them yeah before i come to that jitan jambu let me just share one other thing with you um i think when we uh when we only give classes not only is it incomplete but you could actually be doing an injustice to devotees this was one of my reflections and i'll i'll share what i mean in a class i think what we're trying to do a platform speaker is basically trying to create a gap in someone's consciousness a gap in terms of establishing an ideal for them to aspire towards that they're not currently at so when someone comes and speaks on the platform essentially what they're doing is they are creating a gap because they're saying this is the ideal of spiritual life and this is the reality of where we're at at the moment and this distance needs to be made up and creating that gap is is very good because it it gives people an opportunity to realize where they have to move towards so say that's interesting but then yeah go ahead but but this very dangerous as well like say for example we give a class and we talk about detachment for example which is an important part of spiritual life you know detachment um renunciation is is an aspect even for householders there's a sense that these principles are universal now you can create a lot of inspiration through um philosophy of detachment but if you don't simultaneously give the personal guidance on detachment in someone's life they can hear a class generate an inspiration and then go out of that class and um create a mess in their life or for example in a class you can create great inspiration about this is where we should be in krishna consciousness and you create a great aspiration in someone and it's inspiring but then when they go out into the world they're not able to rise to that aspiration that you've set for them and therefore it can become very depressing or frustrating so a platform speaker their job is to create a gap but what happens is if we don't simultaneously have things which help people to then bridge the gap then we're kind of doing half of the job and we can actually create more mental anguish and frustration within within devotees like i i often say there's a gap between the real and the ideal and this gap is frustrating so there's a few there's three ways in which you can deal with this gap one way is just leave spiritual life altogether because the gap's too uncomfortable i feel too guilty i feel like i'll never get there i become hopeless and say just forget about this gap blank it out obviously that's not good the other way to to deal with this gap is you bring the ideal down you say like okay no they talked about that in class but it's not really practical no one really does that you know let's just be realistic let's bring the ideal down so now there's no gap you feel better but you won't achieve spiritual perfection because you've compromised you've diluted the purity so the only way is to raise the real to the ideal but to raise that real it requires personal coaching um so yeah so i just wanted to share this with you that platform speakers are meant to create a gap between the aspiration and the real 
but then we need to help them fill that gap and rise. That's an amazing thought. I, I, I put it this way that, that I write on the Gita regularly. So one of the things which I find is that at the end of a class, uh, is the audience feeling inspired to rise or is the audience feeling intimidated by how far they have to rise? So, you know, if you are doing the second, then actually our class may philosophically perfectly right. It may be with abundant scriptural information. We can say every single point in the script in that I quoted, I can justify based on scripture. But uh, what is the effect? The effect is not really anukul to bhakti. So when you say that uh, third, uh, second, third part, it requires coaching. So by coaching, what because the word coaching has a technical meaning also. Do you mean that it's more like a one-to-one -one relationship where people share what problems they are facing and how those problems can be dealt with? Yeah, perhaps I can share this quote with you um, hmm. and I'll just put it up on the screen and perhaps you can share it with everyone. Um, this is a quote which uh, really helped me to understand a lot more about this. It's a beautiful quote from Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur where he says, one who gives personal instruction to each and every one does more for others than the platform speakers do. Generally, whatever platform speakers say cannot solve the problems of everyone in the audience, nor can it always benefit every individual. A person's defects are better rectified in a private tutorial class or private coaching than in hearing lectures in a school or college. Therefore, those who instruct particular persons separately can award them something more permanent. So it's a very powerful quote. I mean, you know, it, it just so much corroborated with uh, what, what I was seeing before my eyes. And I think when, when we talk about personal coaching, I think there are different aspects. One is obviously one-to-one, -one, uh, having a friend, uh, a mentor, a counselor, a coach, a shiksha guru, whatever we may call it, and that dynamic. I think there is also something to be said for three or four or five devotees coming together uh, in a smaller group and, and, and in that dynamic, kind of uh, unpacking the teachings in a different way. Um, and then I think uh, also what I would say is when we give classes, I think we can do an element of coaching work in the class as well by giving, uh, along with the philosophy, by giving in that class also aspects of practicality, aspects of application, aspects of nuance, uh, understanding of how this philosophy plays out in the real world. And, uh, and so, you know, I would see on, on those three levels when, when we talk about coaching. Yeah. Add a bit of coaching into the class. Create groups which are almost like in a university. You have like a tutorial where there's a smaller group. And then the one-to-one -one, uh, exchange, heartfelt exchange. And I think when we create those um, uh, and then I would say around that also just a community, a loving community where there are friendships, where, you know, informal exchange goes on uh, of the things that we're learning. That's so true. What I was thinking about is that two, two broad thoughts I had when you're thinking about this three-level approach that actually maybe we also need to we could say expand our definition of what success in Krishna consciousness is. Like you said, your first few years, the definition of Krishna conscious success was often how many books we distributed, how many temples we built, how many devotees were made or initiated or introduced. Now, those are all important definitions of success, but actually to internalize Krishna conscious sustainable way, uh, we need a more holistic definition of success also 
because the kind of work that you're talking about that requires time that requires effort and it's not uh, that you can have like a trophy kind of success i did this much and this much it, it requires a certain level of uh, rising from rajoguna to satvaguna even in our even in our pursuits in krishna consciousness because we we pursue certain things as our desirable goals in krishna consciousness so have you started implementing this and how so how how has the response been for you as you try to do this i think one very important thing is whatever we acknowledge and highlight within our communities that is ultimately then what devotees pursue so i think um a lot of it be- begins with uh what is glorified within our movement if we glorify the numbers of books going out then naturally all the devotees will aim towards that and and that's what they will aspire for because they will see that that is what the leaders are talking about that's what everyone's talking about and if i do that then i'll also be part of that acknowledgement so i think we need to appreciate numbers we need to appreciate that we are a movement in which we are trying to contact and plant as many seeds as we uh, can but i think all we need to do is bring in also a greater appreciation and acknowledgement of the devotees and the and the services that are going on to actually do the qualitative aspect of krishna consciousness and perhaps that tends to go in the background because um yeah it is for different sociological reasons that may not be uh, promoted as much so i think one important thing is what we appreciate acknowledge and highlight publicly that is subconsciously what the devotees will then pursue so i think uh, in order to create this change we need to uh acknowledge the devotees who are serving in many different capacities um yeah true so uh, can we maybe go into a little more specifics example say what would be a platform speaking what would be a message in platform speaking that could create an uncomfortable gap uh and how would say personal coaching help bridge that gap any examples you would like to give for this i mean i think uh probably the most one of the most common ones is our our talk of purity um purity is such a word in krishna consciousness where um you know we're looking for pure devotional service and and so in our classes um we talk a lot about purity and we talk a lot about the standard uh the highest standard uh for example in one's personal conduct in one's personal sadhana in one's personal character um of how one should be and uh and people are inspired by that we're inspired when we hear about becoming non envious we're inspired when we hear about chanting you know all your rounds in complete absorption we're inspired when we uh you know hear about all these aspects of purity um we know purity is the essence and that's what we're trying to go towards but then the reality is when someone walks out of the class we are faced with our own weaknesses we're faced with our own and inabilities to live up to that purity and uh and then what we need at that stage is someone to come to us and say yes that purity is there but it's about progress not perfection and you should be happy where you are and also trying to get to the next step the next stage and then someone to then give incremental steps towards that purity uh, and and actually help devotees by giving them tangible things they can do to get towards that purity otherwise as you said that purity will become intimidating more than actually inspiring and and creating upward mobility in one's spiritual life Mm. so so that can be a very very common one that we we kind of uh, uh come across true so overall 
this you know when i travel across the world and there are there are many devotees who feel that did we do we over promise and under deliver that means that uh, do we actually say that no you will become blissful in krishna consciousness chant hari krishna and be happy and the reality is there are a lot of challenges my understanding is not that the challenges themselves are the problem it is quite affect often the the unexpectedness or the unpreparedness for the challenges that is the problem so if in one sense what you said is that the the platform speaking creates a gap but it also creates a unrealistic expectation that the gap can be easily traded relatively speaking it doesn't sufficiently address the reality and the gravity of the challenges that are going to come when we try to address that gap and when we actually get into doing it that's when the problems start coming what are your thoughts about that like like leadership is like when i think about leadership i think about three things leadership means you have to give inspiration but then after that you have to give education and then after that you have to give facilitation and okay. you have to actually or you know another way to look at it is um teaching is the four e's i say the first thing is to engage you have to be engaging you have to bring people in you have to connect the second thing is then you educate you give the information then the third thing is you encourage you actually generate an emotional buy in to the education that you've given them and then the fourth thing is you empower you actually then give them the tools and the practices to live it and i think when we're talking about under delivering we're we're failing on we're not failing we could be doing better on the empowerment and the facilitation for example i give you an example like uh, five years ago we did a whole push for um as many congregation devotees to go out on book distribution as possible and uh, somehow or other in the manner we managed to uh mobilize over 500 devotees in actual face to face book distribution either in door to door or on you know on the street and you wouldn't believe the number of devotees who came to me after and said prabhu for years we've been told distribute books distribute books distribute books and for years we were given the same message year after year when the marathon came and what we wanted to tell the speakers is that you don't need to convince us we're inspired we're on board please don't just give us the instruction again we, we've we've bought into your idea but what they said is that people just kept giving us the inspiration but they never gave us the education and the facilitation to actually live the inspiration and it was just adding that extra element to just say this is actually how you do it and you know what we are going to walk with you through that experience and help you to do it and the encouragement and empowerment that comes from that means it just activates one's journey and so that when i think when i say when sometimes people may say we're under delivering maybe that's the aspect we're under delivering in um Mm-hmm. more focused i'll give you another example like uh, you've been to many retreats uh, just just to uh, contextualize this yeah. sometimes i feel that say there is sambandha abhidaya and prayojan so we emphasize the sambandha gyan quite strongly and then we also emphasize our, the how glorious our prayojan is parkiya bhav and uh, chaitanya yeah. mahaprabhu's love for krishna but often the abhidaya needs to be made clearer so it's something similar in the, in this case you could say the prayojan is distribute books we want to we want to distribute a lot of books and sambandha is you know we want to serve shri prabhupada we want to serve his movement but as you said the training how, how to providing some kind of support to be able to do that so that is also a form of abhideya yeah yes bro please you can just, just on that abhideya uh, sambandha abhideya prayojan another interesting thought is that 
in, in some bandha and prayojana, we may not necessarily come face to face with our human weakness. In prayojana, you're a pure devotee, you're, you know, and, and everything is very, you know, it, it's a beautiful picture. And in Sambandha, it all fits theoretically. But in Abhideya, we're faced with our own human weakness. Um, we're faced with our own human inabilities. And mm. uh, we're faced with our own, uh, yeah, impurity. And so, like, uh, one thing... Um, one thing I always think about is that they, there cannot be purity unless there's honesty. Mm. Um, one devotee explained it like this. I've never read it like this, but I, it made sense to me. We say there's four defects of the conditioned soul. So he kind of put it in an order and he said, we have imperfect senses. Therefore, the potential to come under illusion is there. And therefore, we're likely to make mistakes. And therefore, we cheat to cover it up. So you put it in an order. I, ne I never read that anywhere, but it kind of made sense. And then what he said is that the imperfect senses coming under illusion and making mistakes, to some extent, you can't do anything about that. But the one thing you can do something about is the cheating propensity. And, and so Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur says, weakness is acceptable, but cheating is outlawed. And therefore, one of the most important thing is that when we do make mistakes, when we do fall short, when we do fall prey to our imperfection, are we going to have the honesty and truthfulness to interact with the devotee and, and, and bring it out and rectify it in a, in a progressive way? And in order for that to happen, there needs to be personal exchange. There needs to be relationship. There needs to be genuine devotee contact because we're not going to be able to do that. Most are not going to be able to do that just by hearing a class and, and doing it within their own selves. And that's why personal coaching is. Um... Mm -hmm. But I'll say one other thing Guru, that um, Here's some food for thought. And, and I don't know, maybe you can reflect on whether you also have this experience. But um, here in the UK, we have uh, our former temple president, Akandadi Prabhu. And uh, he doesn't anymore, but for many years, he was running a retreat center in Wales. And uh, so he would play host to many, many groups who would do retreats there, you know, self-development groups, spiritual groups. And he would also play host to the, the devotees who would come there for a retreat. And, and one time I asked him, what is the difference between our retreats and general, you know, other spiritual groups or self-development groups, the difference between our retreats and their retreats? So he was giving me different differences between us just so I could understand a bit about how we could learn from them. And one interesting thing is he said, our retreats, are full of different lectures about different subjects. So for example, you know, we, we have four days of classes, morning, afternoon, and evening. And uh, we talk about so many different subjects, so much philosophy. Sometimes we could go, you know, span many, many different topics. And what he said is, if you look at these groups, what they'll do is they'll come together for one weekend or four days, and they'll talk about one thing, like gratitude, for example. And every single talk will be about gratitude. And then they'll have um, a workshop on gratitude. And then they'll kind of give people something to do in order to develop gratitude in their life. And, it, and in other words, they just build a whole meditation to take the kind of concept of gratitude and then really kind of embed it within the individual. Um, and, and therefore he was reflecting that sometimes he feels our retreats are just not focused enough. We talk a lot, but we don't 
do it in such a way that we translate it into such a way that it's livable and applicable. Um, and I thought that was quite an interesting uh, observation. But I don't know if you have any thoughts or reflections on that. Mm. You know, two points. Let, let's I'll talk about this first. Yeah. Overall, there is often an assumption that the just the process will automatically produce the necessary virtues. If I'm doing my if I'm doing my chanting properly, if I'm studying scriptures, whatever is the virtue that is desired, it will come. Yes, it can come, but that doesn't mean that that virtue doesn't need to be cultivated. So sometimes uh, the focus is not so much on the cultivation of virtue as on the emphasis on the particular practices. And yes, we all could say study Shastra more, improve the quality of our chanting. But then that is a life, lifelong process. And to substantially, to in experience substantial or tangible improvement in it at our level is not that easy. So I do agree that uh, we rarely talk about specific virtues in sufficient detail. We may say that, okay, just see this character has this virtue and this character has this virtue and this character has this virtue. So, you know, like sometimes devotees, I have written a couple of books on the Ramayana, I'm working on something on the Mahabharat. Now, sometimes when we talk about practical lessons from the Ramayana, it is that you just see how Lakshman obeyed his brother, his older brother, or Sita was always faithful to Ram. We should be like that. Well, that's an inspiration, but that's not a guidance. So in that sense, breaking things down to show how they can be applied. That is definitely, I would say, lacking. But it's a very striking observation. I hadn't articulated it that way. And uh, going back to your earlier point about the four uh, defects. In fact, I have a whole like a visual presentation. I visualize this as four windows. Now the imperfect senses is like one window. And within that is the next window is the tendency to be illusioned. And each of these windows are placed one in front of another after another. Uh, so, or you could say each of them are like doors or windows. So what happens is actually, if I'm starting from here, what I get to see at the end is very narrow because the, my accurate perception of reality will require all four, will require knowledge to come through all the windows. Mm -hmm. So it is true, but the last point about cheating propensity being in our control, that's quite a insightful point. And uh, I also felt that to some extent, if we don't have the facility for guhiyam akhyati pruchyati, for loving exchanges, then devotees only have two options. One is, as you earlier said, that go away from Krishna consciousness or cover up their inability to practice the standards of Krishna consciousness. So in that sense, rather than saying that it is the devotee who is being dishonest, we can also consider the fact that the environment is not really giving much encouragement or even opportunity for honesty. Because sometimes if somebody is candid, somebody is honest, uh, they may be frowned upon, they may be looked down upon. I was at one conference on uh, mental health and spirituality. So this is, we often talk about how spirituality is a way to deal with uh, loneliness because we connect with people. But there was the statistic that religious organizations that have high moral standards, within them, practitioners often feel more lonely than in normal society. Because when they don't have, you know, it's, uh, it's, okay, if I'm failing in my moral standards, I can't speak with anyone about it. Mm -hmm. So I would say that uh, the word, I hadn't thought of the word coaching. In fact, one of the reasons I started this Monk's podcast was to do Guya Makhyati Puchyati. And to also, to to you know, sh show how that can be done on various issues. But uh, I, I very much recognize that without this, the, the heart is not nourished. 
So it Prabhupada in the Nectar of Instruction, in that Gohiya Makati Vrachati Purport, he says, the Krishna consciousness movement is nourished by these six-fold exchanges. That's a beautiful phrase, you know, nourished by these six-fold exchanges. So I fully agree with uh, what you are recognizing as a need. No. I, th- I thought it's quite ironic that, you know, in this year and a half of COVID, when the devotees have been as far away, you know, as ever, disconnected in one sense as ever, <clears throat> that many, many podcasts like this are coming up, which are in, in a sense actually bringing a more intimate type of exchange that we may never have had if, if the world was normal and we were having our normal gatherings. Uh, you know, <laughs> this podcast, uh, Namaras Prabhu's podcast, and many, many like that, you know, Wisdom of the Sages, and so all these have come up where actually devotees are, you know, it may not be personal coaching in one sense, but it, but it's more, I guess, uh, bringing that philosophy onto our very real life experience and, and talking about that publicly, which actually, if you think about it in our temples, we don't do so, maybe the closest we get to that is a Q&A session at the end of a class. Um, so yeah, I, it's, it's quite interesting. This yesterday, I was my, my uncle's birthday was there, so I had called him and talked with him. And uh, he said that, he also made a similar point that uh, it's because of COVID, people are not running around so much. So they are having time, to, they're not talking physically, but they're at least talking digitally. And I would say that, uh, yes, sometimes uh, <clears throat> what you talk about confronting our human weaknesses, Sometimes some situations uh, we could say push us or even force us to confront our weaknesses. And uh, it's uh, it. when I started this podcast, I, one of my friends told me that you had tried, I tried to do this five or 10 years ago. You would say, why are you wasting your time? Do something constructive. <laughs> so I agree that it's happened at the right time also. In one sense, uh, we at a mo- we as a movement are also at a stage where we are reflecting about how to move ahead. You know, there is a significant generational change. There is a significant demographic change. Earlier, we are mostly a temple-based movement. Now we are a community-based movement. So we have Prabhupada's first generation of disciples. Are, uh, the first generation is slowly leaving us. The second generation is uh, now trying to do what it can. So how we are to move ahead, there is a lot of reflection happening. And I think the podcasts are a part of that whole whole system. I was so, thinking, yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, I mean, so far in this session, we've talked a lot about the need for uh, personal uh, interaction, personal instruction, coaching. And uh, perhaps we could to look a little bit into that someone who's able to give other people good advice and coaching because once I was uh, I was doing a seminar for one mentors uh, one group of mentors that we have in the community and what occurred to me was that giving advice is perhaps the, the most frequent service the hardest service the most rewarding service and also potentially the most dangerous service that one can take up. You know, it's such a, it's such an an amazing thing, you know, to be someone who's in a position to give advice and serve others like that, but it requires uh, also training and understanding on how to be a good coach because um, here we are, we could be talking about the need in the Krishna consciousness movement for more coaches, more devotees who are actually helping other devotees on the ground. But then those devotees, how to give good advice to others and the mood in which they should do it, um, what they should do before they give advice what they should do when they're actually giving the advice and how to formulate it, what they should do after they've given the advice 
in order to serve others in the best way. So I don't know if you want to go down that route now. Oh, yes, yeah. definitely, I would say. So you now just to, to contextualize what we discussed, what you said is we need to provide it. There is a need for advice. So I like, in one sense, the word advice is, is much more non-threatening than instruction. Isn't it? So, <laughs> although advice is also, it involves a sense of that the person giving advice has some experience or expertise, but advice is, uh, it's a much more, uh, much more, not just palatable from the audience perspective, but also realistic from the giver's perspective. Because most of us in today's movement are not going to have so much access to say devotee guides who are so high up that we can immediately accept their instructions. So most of us may not have personal association with our spiritual masters. And even if they, even if we have access to them, how much, uh, how much time do they have for us? How much do they know us? So in one sense, that itself is the first thing that, how would you differentiate between advice and instruction when we are giving? I mean, one writer, he says, advice is what people ask for when they already know what they need to do, but they don't want to do it. <laughs> That's true. You know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. In one sense, the super soul inside us is speaking something. And then we want some confirmation from the super soul. If you see in the I like that definition because I feel it, you know, like when we talk about instruction and we become an instructor, it's almost that... First, we put ourselves on a pedestal higher than others. And, and then for that person, there's the pressure of, I have to be a conductor of the divine message, you know? And uh, sometimes it can become a little artificial, a little unrealistic and a little um, utopian. I think advice is, you know, there is a discussion, there is understanding, there is exchange, there's room for iteration, which I think is really, really important. Like uh, when it's an instruction, it's this is what I'm telling you to do. Now go and do it. Whereas when it's advice, I say some things, you say some things back. It's an iterative process, which kind of makes it more realistic. Mm. Um, and I think when it's advice, it doesn't put undue pressure on the person as well. The receiver and, the giver, uh, on both. On, on both, yeah, on both. Because... Uh, there's a sense that when um, the person is receiving it, it's, it's advice. I still have my own options. I have still have my own um, space to kind of, uh, you know, deal with that, how I want to apply it. And from the person's perspective of giving it, um, you know, they're not claiming to be, you know, the speaker of the, you know, the holy word and the hallowed truth, you know, but they're just sharing what they feel according to their experience and their knowledge of Shastra. Um, so it becomes much more comfortable. Um, and in one sense, just to reinforce what you're saying about iterations, uh, if you see that's the model we have in Dhru Maharaj and Narad Muni. Narada tells him, don't take the insult so seriously. And Dhruva says, what you're saying is true, but I can't apply it. And Narada gives him a, gives him a more doable instruction for him. And also the point about advice, which you said, if you see the first conversation in the Bhagavatam between Vyasadeva and Narada Muni, there also Vyasadeva has himself inferred what I did wrong. I didn't glorify the Lord enough. And then Narad Muni comes and reinforces that. Narad Muni is quite forceful. He says, are you satisfied with uh, glorifying the body and the mind instead of the soul? It's a rhetorical question. But that idea of confirming the intuition, that's very much there in scripture. In fact... Uh, yeah, it's a really interesting point that sometimes I think if we don't give people space to reflect on their own uh, situation then we actually block them from coming to their own realization. Like say, for example, um, Parikshit Maharaj uh, puts the dead snake on Shamik Rishi. 
And what Shringi does is he just imp like impetuously, almost impulsively just curses Parikshit. But what we hear about in that dialogue is that Parikshit went away and he actually began to lament that, oh no, I should not have done that. So he already had already come to a corrective conclusion himself. But what Shringi did is he came in and then he cursed. Of course, we know there's a divine plan. But, it, but it's an interesting point that when we, when we come in too quickly with a reaction, then we actually don't give the other person time to actually come to their own realization. Um, Beautiful. Beautiful. And therefore, I think one of the first, when we talk about giving advice, and it's almost a no-brainer, and we see it in Shastra again and again, but we have to say it is, is we just need to first give people time to share what they want to say. You know, we have to hear. You know, the first chapter of the Gita is just Arjun speaking. You know, Sarvabhaum Bhattacharya just speaking. Um, not just jumping in there because when we let people speak, three things happen. The first thing is we get to know their situation better. The second thing is that they get the confidence that you've understood their situation and therefore they're more ready to listen to you. And the third thing is that oftentimes just by the person speaking themselves, they actually come to the conclusion of what they need to do. Um, and, and therefore just letting people speak and hearing them is, uh, is, is so powerful, is such an such a underrated thing. So true, bro. In one sense, all the points I fully agree. The third point especially, actually thinking is a very difficult thing to do. Because in one sense, when we have to think, we have to simultaneously be like two persons. Okay, this voice is saying this, this voice is saying this. If I do this is the good about this, this is the good about that. And it's, it's not so easy to think. But for many people, talking is the way of thinking. While talking, we develop our thoughts. I think Disraeli, he said, most people hate to think. Some people think they think. And other people would rather die than think. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, a, it's a challenging thing you're completely right and, and talking it out is one way in which talking it out is one way in which we can um, in which we can uh, kind of yeah open that thinking so in general somebody who is actually going to be a coach the first thing you're saying is they need to make themselves available they need to have time and again, that itself would require what you said earlier about a modification in our definition, or not a modification, an expansion of our definition of success. If somebody is simply thinking of giving a lot of classes as the definition of success, then that's going to be difficult. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, for sure. I, I, um, I noticed with with quite a few sannyasis who came to the manor, especially in recent years, that they implemented this. And what they would do is, as a sannyasi, you can be invited to unlimited numbers of programs. But what they would do is they would uh, have a number of programs that they would do a week and not go above that number and rather ring fence time um, in order to just meet devotees and speak to them one-on-one -on -one, and, and in order to maintain that balance um, because the tendency is always to go towards quantity. I can say also as a speaker um, that when you make time to individually talk with devotees, then actually your ability to be a more relevant and powerful speaker increases. So even your impact as a speaker is nourished by the personal time you spend with individuals outside of classes 
because that's where you really begin to grasp the needs, issues, and concerns of what people are going through. And then you're able to factor that into your presentation. Beautiful. True. It's, uh, it's actually, you know, there is speaking to people and there is speaking with people. So I would say a person who spends time with people and they're actually, even when they're giving a public class, they're speaking with people. Because when they speak a point itself, then they will think, okay, how will my audience react to this point? What is the question that is going to come? And even when you see a talk that is addressing the questions that are going to come in our mind, then we find the talk engrossing. Otherwise, sometimes the talk becomes like a, just a series of platitudes and then we switch off. So yes, I, I would say that even if, if we do this coaching, then, then we will shift more from speaking to people to speaking with people, even when they're giving the classes. Yeah. So, so one- and I, and I think that- Go ahead. Sorry, I was just, sorry, sorry, you go. No, no, so we were discussing about advice and instruction. I think in that topic only we went to in this direction, but you can, uh, you can complete your point and we'll move ahead. So, I was just thinking at the moment, we're kind of, as someone advising someone else, we're just kind of brainstorming what we have to do before even we speak. And the first thing we said was that we should uh, hear them, you know, and give that time and give that attention. They say attention is the greatest gift you can give someone. Um, and when you give someone attention, uh, it's amazing what you can draw out of that person and what that person uh, naturally wants to give out of themselves. And I think attention in listening, I mean, we do all many workshops on empathetic listening and so on, but it is such a powerful thing if we're able to give people attention. And then the second thing I would say is um, questions are really important before you give any advice to ask people questions. Because what happens when you ask questions is that you begin to not only pick up on the issue that someone is facing, but you also begin to get a sense of what their emotions are um, within that whole realm of that situation. And sometimes I think when we give advice, we're only addressing an issue without understanding the emotion of what someone is going through. And therefore your advice may be great, but it won't hit the spot because there's a deeper emotional kind of thing going on there. So I think questions help to um, uncover emotions. Questions actually help you to get to the root cause of what someone's problem is. Oftentimes people may voice a problem to you, but actually all their voicing is a very superficial level of the problem. And if you give advice to them just based on their superficial explanation of the problem, your advice will also be only superficial. And therefore, as a coach, what you really need to do is try to get to the deeper root. Okay, what is the actual problem here? Because what person voices may not be the actual problem. And, um, and when you ask good questions, and I think coaching is very much based around this, by asking good questions, a lot of the time you can help people uh, find their own answer. And we've kind of talked about that as well. So um, true. we have to hear the unheard. <laughs> is, yeah, I think the standard metaphor for this is the tip of the iceberg. Is yeah. it, is every problem, when what is voiced initially is the tip of the iceberg. I also appreciate this here that uh, it also requires people time to open up because especially when somebody is sharing a deeply personal issue, it's uh, there are two, three reasons. One is they themselves may not know what the deeper issue is. It's also because they are also trying to not only really seeking a solution, but they're also seeking to understand what the problem is. So that is one reason why it's just the tip of the iceberg that comes out. Another is there is hesitation about how the other person will react. So the person, they speak something and they see how we react. And if we are not shocked, if you're not uh, 
if we don't react in a very negative way then they may open up a little bit more and third is also that uh, in general uh, it's by speaking i i do seminars on journaling so one of the things i have stated over there is that words are not just tools for expressing our thoughts words are also tools for discovering our thoughts and for developing our thoughts mm -hmm. so both of them are there and that's why patience is very much required to get to get to the heart of the issue yeah so Now, so then that, I would say one more thing is very important before we give any advice. So hearing them, questioning them, and then uh, probably the most important um, is reflecting. And uh, oftentimes we have to do this on the spot because you know someone's asking, and then we have to respond. But there must be uh, a good period or some qualitative reflection. and and what does that reflection mean like to understand uh what they're saying um and to really kind of clarify what the issue is what the root cause of the problem is then we have to draw on our knowledge of shastra our knowledge of you know the acharyas and what they've taught about different situations so we have to draw then on spiritual knowledge we then have to draw on our own experiences i think also we need to before we advise someone we need to be very aware of our biases um because sometimes we may have like a certain bias which uh sometimes we need to declare when we're speaking to them or giving advice to them which helps them to then uh, take it in the right way so what do you mean by our uh, biases for example um like say for example uh i grew up uh or i had a very strong experience in my early life that that's created a very strong character trait within me say for example if i was um i had trouble with authority figures in my youth and therefore i have a chronic problem with trust therefore if someone's asking me a question on authority or someone's asking me about a problem that they're having with an authority and uh, you know asking for advice in that situation i may want to tell them that you know i i do have very strong opinions on this because of experiences i've gone through in my life because otherwise what we do is we project our experiences onto others and kind of skew and and are not neutral actually first of all it takes a sub significant level of self awareness to know about our biases then it requires a, a huge amount of candor to speak those and especially to speak to those to someone who is coming to us for advice it's not that easy so it's a so giving advice is it's also going to require a significant amount of maturity satva guna isn't it i'm not sure yeah, at what what stage I, i like this uh, it's yeah please go i ahead. think this quote is powerful and it needs to be unpacked but i think it has a lot of power in it if we think about it which is that maybe nowadays we tell people what to think rather than how to think and uh i th i i kind of reflect on that a lot and i think that that's why i kind of came up with this point of biases because we've come up with we've had a lot of experiences in our life and when we're giving advice to others we can just project that onto them and tell them this is how you could, you should think um so oh, okay. by by declaring a bias or by declaring these things we help them to understand how i'm coming to the conclusion of giving this advice to you and we're helping them so that when they receive that advice they can think about the advice the biases the situ the space where it's coming from and then think for themselves about what then needs to be done with that piece of advice true okay so actually in one sense telling people 
how to think is education telling them how to think what to think is in some ways it can be indoctrination it's it's not a very healthy thing because one of the aspects which i feel about advising is important is that advising shouldn't create a perpetual dependence in the advisor the person should also learn to become independently thoughtful over a period of time in fact if we see the bhagavad gita if krishna had simply wanted to give an instruction to arjuna krishna could have completed the whole bhagavad gita in six words i am god obey me fight <laughs> the whole gita would have been over <laughs> but krishna doesn't do that you know, krishna goes through a whole elaborate process, process of reasoning by which he helps arjuna say okay how do you reason how do you analyze how do you understand what are the ultimate values of life and then arjuna comes to a decision reasoning and yeah definitely and also what does krishna say again and again iti me mati is just my opinion this is my opinion and then krishna obviously at the end says yat icha tatha you know whatever your desire is that you do so it's almost that when he's advising he's giving um he's you know guiding but he's also creating space for someone to think um uh yeah so it's a dialogue you know it's um yeah that's beautiful so now we talked about first is what to do you know what all that we should be able to hear we should be able to admit our biases and then one of the things which i find helpful i mean you can also reflect on this that it's always better to give like a multi level advice rather than a, like a one zero thing do this and don't do this you know you can do this or do this or do this what krishna does in the 12th chapter of the gita also that 12 point if you see 8 to 11 12 you can practice at this level at this level at this level so then people feel that yeah this this makes sense this this i can do mm. any thoughts yeah there's that? nothing there's nothing worse for someone than uh feeling like a failure or feeling like they've let someone down um that can be very demoralizing you know uh you know often times shila prabhupad would even say like i changed the instruction just because i knew if i gave the the ultimate instruction the person wouldn't have been able to follow it and it would have been uh injurious towards their spiritual journey so i think it's a great point we must give options krishna says if you can't fix your mind on me then engage in the regulative practices if you can't do that do this if you can't do this do this um progress not perfection and um what also happens when you give options is that when people by your advice are able to move forward even one step then their capacity to embrace more advice and embrace more guidance um increases and then that means they can take more steps forward So also giving advice is a relationship that needs to be built up cumulatively and that means that the person giving the advice needs to have faith that this person is taking me seriously and the person getting the advice should feel that the per- the advice I'm getting from this person is helping me move forward so when you give options then what you eliminate is a situation where the advice is so high that the person can't follow it and then the person doesn't move forward at all because if the person can't follow it the speaker gets uh, frustrated and if they don't therefore move forward at all they get frustrated and then the whole relationship breaks down true so this is uh... and when you say prabhupad said that i remember that with respect to divorce like one devotee wanted to separate and prabhupad knew that they had already made the decision so then prabhupad didn't really put his foot down but are there other occasions also when prabhupad said i don't give the highest i'm sure there must be mm. if you see in one sense prabhupad in the 1960s 
had much more time and prabhupada was more like a coach for the devotees in the 1960s if you read those chapters of the lila amrut also there's a very very intimate mood at that time mm-hmm. so what we are talking about coaching is also modeled by prabhupada in the early years of our movement yeah and and i think um connected to this point of giving options is to give advice which is achievable and at the same time challenging and getting that um i think in the modern world of self development they call it your flow state because they say you have a potential and then you have a challenge and they say if the potential that you have is higher than the challenge is higher than the challenge then um you'll become bored so you won't achieve your flow state and if the challenge is higher than your potential then you'll become too stressed and you'll break so the flow state occurs when your potential is matched with a challenge and then you almost achieve the maximum traction and so it's very much an art for i think Shila Prabhupada used to say, "Bend without breaking," you know. So to give someone advice which is achievable, um, but at the same time challenging, and finding that mark, um, because sometimes we can just be too light and just want to give people very easy advice, you know, and be the good person, you know, they're happy, you're happy, but there's not much growth. and the other time is we may just give something too high that they're not able to do and then it you know as we said it breaks down so it's a real art to know um like narad muni tells mugrari the hunter like uh don't at least kill them fully <laughs> don't half kill them so it's almost like you know it, it's achievable but it's like you know it, it's uh, it's going to challenge them and bring them forward so there's a kind of you know beautifully put huh? that i had heard about flow but this presentation of flow into the challenge and potential mm-hmm. one of the you could say one of the difficulties in the practice of bhakti is that uh, we may have a certain set of preconceptions of where people should be hmm? when we are dealing with people and then that creates a huge problem for me i spent say for the first 10 years of my life in india doing outreach only to youth and then i started going to america and then i realized the audience is entirely at a different level and then uh, so they may in the long run have everybody has the potential to love krishna but there are there are i read recently one quote that you know there are no unrealistic goals but there can be unrealistic time limits unrealistic deadlines so everybody can come to a level of purity but not everybody can come to the level of purity in the same time so i think that individualized individualization of the presentation of bhakti that is what is uh, not possible if you are doing platform speaking now i w- i would like to just change the subject a little bit see within not exactly change but develop it in a different direction so we are within an institution and there are certain standards that we expect uh, practitioners to follow so to what extent can the coaching accommodate um, say lapse from the standards deviation from the standards and uh, there is a aspect of standardization which is important to have some kind of uniformity now what is a particular movement about but then people are very every person is an individual and nowadays almost every individual is coming from a quite a complicated background so people are troubled mm-hmm. so 
what is uh, when we are giving coaching it's a matter of uh, we have to invest time and energy and a thought in coaching someone so at one level it's reasonable to expect some level of reciprocation so how do we decide whom we are going to coach because we don't have the time to coach everyone not everyone is going to value the coaching also so there has to be some basic denominator of we can say spiritual seriousness or spiritual interest any thoughts on that so how do we decide who we should coach or who should we should be coached by like that how do we form that relationship say, yeah i would say the second part if we, if we are going to offer time as a coaching to someone as a coach to someone how do we decide that and also from the other perspective we'll come to that that you know i would also not need a coach who is too who, de- who expects too high things from me generally in 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 shastra rupa goswami says in terms of friendship he talks about like mindedness number 1 then he talks about trust and intimacy um and then he also talks about ashraya ability to give spiritual shelter so essentially like we gravitate towards taking shelter of and um taking seriously the expectations and advice of individuals who we seem to number one be uh on a like minded similar wavelength in other words we have faith that they know us the second thing is this trust this intimacy we have faith that they love us and the third thing is that um this spiritual advancement there in that person in other words they can help us so naturally someone will look for someone who they think they know me they love me and they can really help me and then they'll naturally be open to taking advice from such a person So I think when we're thinking about who to advise we should try to approach uh, relationships where that investment may be made by the other person because then your ability to convey your advice to them and for them to take it seriously uh, will be increased but also these three factors are also ultimately developed in relationship So if you find someone who may not have these necessarily these three things but you see potential openness then um then 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 it could be a worthwhile relationship to pursue. And then of course one has to decide how many how many individuals. Uh like for example we have a mentorship system here and I'm not sure the exact number but there is a limit on the number of mentees you can have. because uh, naturally we have limited amounts of time um so yeah these those are some other practical considerations hmm so in one sense what you're saying is uh when we are decide if we as a speaker are trying to give advice or it is largely dependent on whether the person receiving advice has has developed a certain level of openness and eventually trust true and over a period of time how would you uh, assess the success of uh, this whole process of coaching what would be the parameters for that of course uh I don't think uh in spiritual life when we're trying to help devotees go forward we realize that it is about a destination but it's not about a destination as well. And let me explain what I mean. The destination is pure devotional service and we want, you know, people to reach there. But the other aspect is that we just want people to as make as much progress towards that as they can. And so I think when we're assessing the success of any relationship is not necessarily about how far they are from the goal but how much closer they've come to the goal as a result of the relationship that you have with them in other words if i was to go in and and say i was working with these 20 individuals 
my measure of success for them would not be that after um, two years with them, uh, they should all be chanting 16 rounds. That's the destination where I'm trying to take them. But my measure of success would be how far have I brought them and where were they and where are they now? Uh, maybe they're only chanting eight rounds, but they weren't doing anything before. So I think it has to be based around progress um, and, and improvement. And, uh, and, and then you may say, okay, but what aspects of progress and improvement? And I think it's qualitative and quantitative. There has to be some quantitative measure of improvement, which uh, a genuine external commitment to spiritual life but then there there also has to be a qualitative analysis that this person now has more faith in me they've overcome certain anartas or blocks that we may not see in terms of a number but there, there there's definitely improvement there and then we have to do that analysis on both sides to see how well the relationship is working mm. Qualitative and quantitative. This is an interesting point which you mentioned about uh, about assessing the success. Sometimes I say that when we are in our spiritual life, if we are feeling discouraged, we need to look back to see how far we have come. If we are feeling proud, we have to look far ahead to see how far we have to go. So it it depends on what we are, what state of a person is in, what state we are looking for. So. It's a lot of uh, lot of a lot of patience will be required to customize each to present Krishna consciousness in a customized way to different individuals. And uh, so, do you see this as something happening? Say you are trying to do this in London. Do you see this happening in UK and other places also? Do you see this happening elsewhere in the world? In one sense, in Radha Gopina Temple, the counselor system was started. Was to some extent for this purpose, and there are there are a lot of devotee care initiatives. Now, devotee care has many different aspects to it, but uh, overall, do you see this as a trend that is happening? Yeah, I think I think definitely we do have much more devotee care systems which are being uh, created and implemented in different parts of the world. We have programs like Bhakti Vriksha, where there's a very personal care. I guess today what I'm stressing on more than the system, um, which I think is moving in a good direction, is to improve the quality of the advice giving. Um, and uh, as I said, it's the, it's the most frequent service we do. Uh, it can be the most difficult service that we do. It can also be the most rewarding service that we do, and it can also be the most dangerous service that we do. And therefore, my, my point more is on the um, quality of how we then give that advice and guidance and, and, and you know, um, yeah, training each other and helping each other to become better, better givers of advice. Like, say, for example, I, know, I think another really important principle in giving advice is balancing the practical and the transcendental. And I think do we sometimes get the, uh, you know, the balance wrong, you know, like, say, for example, someone's going through a bereavement. Then what I find is that devotees can go to one extreme or the other. Either they go on a very transcendental extreme where they try to give the person knowledge, you know, no one's died, the wise lament neither, you've got to go beyond it, you've got to think of the vision of eternity. And, um, or it just becomes very sentimental, very emotional care, very, you know, a lot of kindness, but no injection of spiritual wisdom that will elevate the consciousness and elevate the discourse. And, and generally, we find no one will go to one complete extreme than the other, but they tend towards one or the other. And again, it's about how to bring it to the middle as, an, as a giver of advice, where you give people something practical they can do, 
something tangible, something down to earth and relatable. And within that, you give them spiritual knowledge that will then elevate the discourse and, and elevate the consciousness to a higher level. And so, uh, you know, it's, um, it's such an art, you know, like, like devotees are having a relationship problem. They're having a relationship mm. problem with someone else. So again, we can just give very transcendental tips, you know, um, hate the mm. disease, not the disease. Or we can say, you know, like uh, ultimately, you know, just very, you know, transcendental. Yeah. I think if I yeah, we can just go into like, you know, uh, friendship counseling, you know, like understand their heart. And, you know, so somehow we need to bring those together. True. Yeah, uh, this balance of transcendental practical is so important. It's recently now in because of COVID, lots of uh, devotees have their relatives or in India, at least departing. So many devotees ask me, what, what can you, what can we read? Which section of scripture can we read? Uh, or what? how can we counsel people? Now, some devotees suggested read Garud Puran. Now, Garud Puran has some scary descriptions of the description of the journey of the soul through hell. That's not going to console at all. So, and I was taken aback to find that you know, grieving is a big thing. It's a universal human experience. But there's not a single book from the Hindu perspective on grieving. So I just did a three-part course on growing through grief. So what you talk about the balance between the, I tried to negotiate that. In fact, the Krishna tells Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita that you're not the body or the soul. In fact, in the 13th chapter itself, Krishna says that the, those in knowledge are not attached. And he uses specifically the word putra dara graha adishu to sons, wives, and others like that. And yet, this is the 13th chapter. And in the 13th day of the Kurukshetra war, Abhimanyu dies. And Krishna doesn't throw any philosophy at Arjuna at that time. Krishna is very empathic, very gentle, very encouraging. So, you know, how the philosophy is to be implemented, to be actualized in life, how it is to be shared, that is an, uh, that is an art which has to be very carefully learned. So, true, relationships also. For devotees, we often focus on humility. And humility is very important. All of us need to develop that. But at the same time, if we are to do some service for Krishna, as devotees, sometimes we also need to be assertive. You know, so I think focusing only on one side can lead to problems. So now we don't want to become aggressive and ab abusive or abrasive. That's another extreme. But that balance between the practical and the transcendental is vital. So I... It's like this beautiful example of the potter who's molding... I think it's a potter or a sculptor or whatever it may be. And what they do is one hand they put inside. And then from the outside, they knock. So if that hand is not inside and they knock, you'll break. And if the hand is just inside, but there's no knocking, you, there's no change. So how effective are we in giving that support and then knocking in order to, you know, build a beautiful spiritual life in partnership with someone, are we able to do that? Um, it's such an art, how, how to actually balance that. And so I think the more that mentors or people doing this service come together and share ideas with each other, then they'll go out there and they'll just become so much more edified and empowered when they speak to people because, um, Remember, here is Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur saying that the platform speaker can't do as much as the personal coach can do in terms of practically solving people's problems. So that the amount of influence that a, that a personal coach has on someone's life is actually, uh, you know, it's vast. Um, so just as we train devotees in speaking, we, we do courses, so we make sure they know Shastra, you know, we, we, we should also have the similar amount for um, giving advice because it's so, it's a game-changing service. True. So I also liked one point which you mentioned earlier, that irrespective of the system that might be there, 
whether whatever dude name we have whatever structure we have what is important is that how do we improve the quality of the advice that is given and that focus also is empowering in the sense that you are not waiting for a system to change whatever the system we can we can each devotee at individual level can work to try to contribute better wherever they are so yeah. are there any other points you would like to discuss i had a couple of points to uh, make I, i would just say um so we kind of talked a little bit about um what we should do before we give advice then we talked a little uh, quite a bit about you know the kind of advice and the factoring that we have to um kind of build into the equation when we give advice and then i would just say also another really important thing is what we do after we give advice you know it's remarkable we... <laughs> that i was going to raise the same point and i said a couple of points that is good we are thinking on the same lines yeah yeah so like it is so important what we do after we give advice because um how something lands in someone's heart is very very important so i think the first thing is um i try to do this when i give advice is i just get feedback and i ask the person how does this sound to you is it achievable do you think you can do it you know uh, what potential obstacles could there be in this preempt any difficulties that they may have in following your advice by having a discussion so you close it up nicely um it's almost like when you do an operation you open so you open up an issue then you go in and you sort everything out but then close it up in a nice way so the person can walk away as a healthy individual i think one major difference between advising and instructing also is that uh the locus of responsibility stays with the individual Mm, and i think that as a movement is important for us not just for say managerial or legal purposes but also from the perspective of the kind of the world we live in if we give an instruction and doesn't work then that person may blame and there could be various reasons why it happened but in general for the growth of an individual outsourcing the decision making process to someone else is never healthy mm, and Yeah, yeah i think the in the institutional responsibility and personal responsibility is like it's all with there's attention there i almost see it like what the institution does is it it creates the boundaries of the the playing field and then within that playing field the individual has the responsibility to do you know and act and 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 approach and make decisions like that and uh you know like a psychological need within each one of us is safety and also freedom mm. it doesn't matter where who you are everyone needs a certain amount of safety oh so if we say safety and freedom the as a continuous everyone is somewhere along that and there's an aspect of both in everyone's life and i think one of the interesting thing about iskon is that you can find you know as you go to different parts of the iskon world you can find different sizes of playing field um where there's maybe you know a little less freedom and a little more safety um and and places where there's more freedom and less kind of institution or boundary around what you do and so it's for everyone to choose their playing field find a space within the movement where they feel they get the freedom and then within that playing field they have to take the responsibility themselves hmm so it's almost like you can say the it's like we're playing the same game but almost some more different versions of the game if you consider cricket there are different formats of cricket so we are all trying to be krishna conscious but a different combination of safety and liberty and in one sense human psychology is also like that some people are more enterprising and risk taking and some people are more security seeking so the ideal 
the ideal situation is again what you said earlier about the flow you know how much challenge how much adventure or liberty or freedom does a person want and how much does it provide them how how much does the situation provide them so mm-hmm. finding that is very important and again one more thing which uh, I, which with respect to the guidance i realized is that sometimes even a guide has to have the maturity the advisor that maybe i am not the best person to give advice to this person and maybe gracefully hand over that person to someone else you know okay, the way you think the way you are uh, you know maybe this person will be able to advise you better yeah no that was that was one of the points i was to raise yeah that sometimes it also makes a lot of sense to just get another opinion and uh, and and have another devotee who can uh, who can help or to verify or to augment the advice that you've been given um Oh, so you are talking that augment the advice you are talking from the receiver's perspective or the giver's perspective or both i both both could be either yeah okay and um i i kind of just on a related point i i kind of heard a little bit of the podcast you had with radhe shampu when he was making the point of individuals having access to many leaders not just one leader um and uh, and 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 it is a similar point here you know that you know there there can be different devotees who are expert in different areas and therefore you may be an advice giver for someone but it's not that you can't draw on the experience of other individuals and they can't draw on the experience of other individuals in certain specific issues where they may have um more um yeah more of a wholesome understanding So and this is a really important point that sometimes as givers of advice we don't have to know the answer to everything and um sometimes we may feel a subtle pressure or we may create that expectation within ourselves and then we can do a discredit to a devotee that's also the system of guru sadhu and shastra so there is apart from the particular teacher particular advisor there is a there are there other advisors also there are other people who can who can turn to guidance from also if you look at the scriptures also look at the ramayana and the mahabharat in general we see either ram in the forest or the pandavas in the forest they hear from many different sages so it's uh, it's they are getting advice from various perspectives and in fact one of the questions if you read the Mah- the mahabharat is a very big book and if you read the philosophical conversations in the mahabharat the yudhishthir is repeatedly asking different versions of the same question now why did such a catastrophe befall me and my family and different sages are answering from different perspectives so we don't know that a particular answer from a particular perspective from a particular source may actually satisfy the person so we don't have to take the we don't have to think that what is that called i think in christianity the savior syndrome we are not the we are not the saviors we are actually as i said that i i like the word advisors mm, so let's do one of the very important thing i think after we've given advice um is that we have to be detached and uh, i think this is sometimes one of the most difficult ones like because you invest time you listen to someone you hear them out you do all the thinking you know you rack your brains and then you give them advice and then they don't take it they don't act on it um there's one famous saying where uh it takes a good person to give good advice but it takes a great person to accept good advice you know so it, it actually takes a lot of spiritual advancement like not so of spirit but a lot of trust a lot of an investment for someone to then take your advice and and implement it and as givers of advice we shouldn't underestimate that and just accept uh, expect that everyone will follow everything we tell them to do because if you do that then you may find yourself becoming uh very frustrated and and then giving up on relationships giving up on individuals um you know uh mm. so 
It's an important point to realize that someone also may want to follow your advice. Sometimes when someone doesn't follow their advice, we immediately question, do they respect me? Do they trust me? Do they, uh, do they, are they really serious about this relationship? But what we don't realize is that another reason why they may not be do, you know, following through is just because they have a weakness within them. They do trust you. They do take you seriously. They do want to follow what you have to say, but they just can't. And so we have to be ready for that. Otherwise, um, we just feel, again, like you were saying, like, I just spent two hours with you. I could have distributed, gone out and distributed 40 books, but I took this quality time with you and nothing's come from it. And so we have to be very careful. Otherwise, we'll just become advisors and then we'll pull out very too quickly. Now, it has to be balanced because you also have to realize when you're not able to be having a, a, an impact on people's lives. And then you may say, clearly, I'm not the person to help this individual. Um, but a certain amount of detachment is required to at least give the space for the and time for the relationship to possibly work. Mm. I like how you phrased it also. I am not the right person to help this person help. It's not that that person is a bad person because they're not taking our help. So these are all ways in which uh, sometimes a person may not take the advice, but still they may take a positive impression about the advisor. And that may help them eventually in their spiritual life, if not immediately. So sometimes the success of an interaction like you earlier talked about sowing seeds. Sometimes even a one-to-one -one interaction may, may lead only to sowing a seed. It may not lead to the, to the manifesting of the Bhakti Latabi or the result emergence of the fruits and the flaw of the fruits. So we also need to be satisfied with that. And that is especially not easy if we have invested a lot of time and thought and energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes, you know, the, the devotees, you know, they may ask someone, who made you a devotee? Who, who made you a devotee? It's like a common kind of question. Or how did you become a devotee? And uh, I mean, we all know it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a timeline, it's a process, it's a life cycle. And there were many things which happened along your journey at what point did you become a devotee? It depends how you, is, was that, does that, are you talking about the first contact? Are you talking about the first, you know, philosophical acceptance? Are you talking about the first devotee that you really connected with? They're, all of these things are on the life cycle, on the life journey. And so, yeah, it's a very important point that someone who's an advisor, they also have to accept that I may not be the person walking side by side with this person to perfection, but maybe I'll just be taking them on to the next person or the next stage or the next situation. Um, and that's glorious. That's wonderful. Um, if, if we're able to do that. Mm. And, and just on detachment, I mean, uh, you know, there are many sannyasis in our movement who are gurus and, you know, here at the man I've, I've, had the opportunity to serve many of them and also being in the room when gurus are dis advising their disciples and then being aware of what the advice was and, and what happened after. And then you realize that even gurus are not able to advise their disciples and ensure that those disciples will follow. So if gurus are not able to do it, um, as an advisor, we should also not have an inflated kind of uh, unrealistic expectation of how, you know, people will necessarily or should uh, react to whatever advice we give them. Okay, that's a sobering thought. Yeah, and I have talked also with several spiritual masters and... Uh, I mean, what one of the things that they're told is that it's a 
even they don't so much give instructions to people because it's more of uh, they d- it depends on the level of the receptivity the level of the relationship so they may also they because in one sense not obeying the spiritual master is a serious thing not obeying advisor is okay that's a different thing so it is not just uh, so the so it is spiritual masters themselves take the responsibility to prevent putting the disciple in a position where the disciple might commit guru aparad so that that's also in one sense a part of the broader understanding of the ninth offense to instruct a faithless person in the glories of the holy name broadly it means you know, to give an instruction that people can't have faith in that people don't have the adhikar to follow mm-hmm. so yeah detachment it brings us back to karmanne vadikar aste ma phaleshu kadachana mm, true and krishna has that detachment he he ultimately he steps away at the end and says um he is interesting because krishna says yathechasi tatha kuru and then in the next verse he says but i'll tell you my supreme instruction so he's emotionally invested he's willing for arjun to do it in his heart he's saying come on arjun do it but he does also give that space as well so it's almost like it's an inner desire for that individual but you have to give the um like that you know in the beginning you give love then you give discipline and then you have to ultimately give independence um and and then the final thing i would say is um one minute about that arjuna krishna arjuna thing see I, chakravarti pad's commentary what it seems to indicate is that after krishna gives the the you could say the detached kind of now you do what you want but he sees arjuna actually eager for more arjuna is pensive and arjuna is what should i do so then krishna's heart overflows with compassion so in one sense there is a difference between detachment and indifference mm. so krishna is detached but he is not indifferent mm. and because he is not indifferent that's why when he sees arjuna is seeking more he gives more so indifferent means i did my job now you you now everything else is your responsibility but detaches mm-hmm. i did my job but if there's something more you want me to do there's something more i can do to help i'm i'm ready to do that so it's a, it's a subtle but a very significant difference it's not that it's not that 65 and 66 as canceling 64 in 1864 mm-hmm. is krishna is saying do what you desire but that it's krishna is almost giving instruction 65 66 so it is a matter of uh, levels so it's it's a uh, it's actually well, that's that section of the gita is one of my favorite sec- is, is my favorite section how krishna's heart comes out more and more in all those verses and yeah that is so important because if you're giving someone advice and at the very end you just become so detached that you just say okay there it is i'm gone it almost leaves the person with a feeling that you know they they're much less likely to take it on because they feel oh my god like is he really with me still but when you say look it's up to you but i'm here i'm going to help i'm going to and and this was the last point i was going to make that after we give advice we must follow up we must follow up and we must say how is it going how how was it possible do we need to change it do we need to you know was there some negative thing that came from it that we need to address again and and you know again like a surgeon like doing the operation but then you know coming back and seeing how everything is healing um so it's very much this metaphor of a surgeon um you know uh is a very i i remember you using that metaphor of a surgeon when talking about the cutting words of a sadhu and you were mentioning that first you do also you know you don't just go in with a knife you also do an anesthetic you prepare the ground and then you go in you cut in a very measured way and you know so yeah it's is such a powerful metaphor like the the metaphor of a surgeon and how that um relates to giving advice true the follow up sometimes it can seem intrusive to some people 
but for many people actually follow up shows care and uh, one of the things which i found you no know, i write regularly and i try to encourage devotees to write so in general in trying to develop any good habit uh, this is this is the concept of having some habit partners or accountability partners it makes a huge difference that you just you just have to tell maybe every week what did you do even if it's a 5 minute interaction just the knowledge that okay i'm going to have this interaction that keeps us focused otherwise it's so easy to get distracted to get lost so now with respect to follow up also i mean we we'll just con- conclude with this but i would say that uh, the follow up also has to be a little open ended that means uh, rather than demanding or expecting that the person has done it than whatever we had told it's like it's more uh, the, again going back to your medical metaphor it's if a person you, we operated if somebody is operated on and now uh, they are suppose their hand was in a cast and now its sling has come out and they are trying to raise it so if they are not able to raise their hand we don't hold them guilty for that it's more of okay what went wrong and yes maybe they didn't do the exercises that were required maybe they didn't take the medication that was required that could be a possibility but that's not the presumption so so one of the things that i find is especially with authority figures is that if what they are done is not told sometimes they just presume that the subordinate is at fault sometimes the situation may be wrong so there are so many other factors so mm, this could be a big subject but maybe what do you what are your thoughts about being non judgmental in dealing with people in one sense to progress but whether somebody is progressing or not we have to make judgments otherwise just before i go on to that like uh, i was just reading giriraj maharaj's new book and uh, yeah and he talks about this uh, shila prapa giving him a very strong instruction to write books um mm-hmm. to write and uh, you know then he got loaded with many projects and and then eventually he took that up and then he makes this very strong point that the spiritual master's instructions can be delayed but never disobeyed Yeah. and it's very uh, it's very poignant because you know everything again you're right it has its timeline and um it might not have been the right time for that person but it's sitting there and the person has um has has registered your advice and and is and is working on it so that's a really important point that you know sometimes your advice is not that it's been rejected but it's sitting there and someone will take it seriously at at the appropriate time and so we shouldn't become discouraged that um if something doesn't immediately appear to be implemented um mm. so in one sense we are we are deferring judgment also just like they may delay the instruction of the spiritual master we may also need to defer judgment about where they are or why they are doing what they are doing so true in if we could actually adopt the coaching like this you know the movement will become much more of a home rather than we have many different metaphors there's the metaphor of the home there's a the more metaphor of the battlefield so the home office there's a the metaphor of the boot camp there's <laughs> there the metaphor of cantonment military camp where we are going to go hospital. out sorry hospital hospital yeah so i think every metaphor has its utility at the same time if we are going to see somebody going to practice bhakti in the long run no, nobody stays lifelong in a hospital nobody stays lifelong in a office so there has to be the feeling that where we are practicing as bhakti the association that is like a home and that 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 this kind of coaching relationship would play a key role in giving that giving that sense of belonging and connectedness we so so true so that's a beautiful point bro i think you've uh, 
I think that point that you've just made is really the, uh, a beautiful conclusion. And um, yeah, I think it, it, it's such an important topic and I'm, I'm happy we had the opportunity today to, uh, uh, at least for myself, edify my understanding on this. Oh, it was, you know, there are many of these things which were, for me, uh, nebulous or unarticulated. But the way you, I can clearly see your thought deeply about it and you had a very good structure. So I'll try to summarize your structure with your permission. But um, so we started the discussion with, uh, you know, about your journey and how you initially were doing a lot of outreach, giving talks and distributing books, but then you felt inspired to cultivate a group of devotees at one place. And that's where that beautiful quote of Bhaktivinoda Thakur that those who can benefit people more are not the platform speakers, but the, those who guide personally because they can address specific issues and have more enduring impact. And then the whole discussion was centered on that. So broadly, if we talk about giving classes, giving classes is about introducing a gap, or telling people that where they are is far from where they can be or they should be. The gap between the practical and the ideal. And then if that gap is too much, then either people bring down the ideal or they just go away from this journey or they are provided guidance to move from the practical to the ideal. And that guidance involves essentially, so we discussed about Samman, Davide and Prayojan. So Prayojan is very, very attracted to the heart, uh, the beautiful loving past tense of Krishna. You can say, the samanda is quite attracted to the head. Everything seems to logically fall in place. This is the purpose of life, this is the meaning of life. But samanda is where things can become quite messy. So how, uh, how do we actually apply? So uh, that example of uh, telling devotees to distribute books as contrasted with giving them some support, some guidance, some resources to distribute books. That is a very apt example. And that's, so that is with more with respect to an activity. So even for uh, something which is a very external kind of activity if some support is required and how much more would that be required for the inner work that is the essence of bhakti so purity is a is very much required that's our aspiration in bhakti at the same time that's a it's a challenge so progress not perfection that is a repeated theme you talked about and uh, for that purpose uh, that the individual guidance is uh, important. And then when you talk about coaching, personal coaching, it could be at three levels. One is one-to-one -one interactions uh, where a devotee helps somebody else. And then small groups where devotees come together and flesh out the process and churn their hearts in association. And the third is even our classes become a little more practical. So we integrate, I was talking about three levels that you mentioned, one-to-one -one coaching, uh, group uh, churning, and then more practical aspects within the classes also. So talking with people rather than talking at talking to or talking at people helps to understand where they're coming from. And then our classes become more relevant, more helpful for people. So now with respect to one, I think we, among those three, we focused maximum on the one-to-one -one coaching, what all would be required. So the first thing is that we don't give instructions, we give advice. So the difference is that in advice, uh, neither the speaker nor the audience feels too much pressure. Now the speaker nor the receiver that I have to be perfect or the receiver has to feel I have to obey everything. And then there is a, op there's a possibility for iterations, discussion. And advice also means that people get to get their own intuition reinforced, like happened with Narada, Vyasa and Narada. So then while giving advice, the first thing is hearing. So hearing helps us to understand where people are coming. It reassures people that we have understood them. And it sometimes helps them also figure things out just by the act of speaking. And then we discuss how thinking is very difficult. So thinking is more easily done by talking, relatively speaking. And then ask, so hearing is one aspect, then questioning. Questioning and reflecting are the second aspect. So questioning helps us to go beyond the tip of the iceberg. 
people may not be sharing the whole problem because they themselves may not have understood it they may be they may be embarrassed to share it entirely or they may themselves be needing the words to articulate their thoughts so the questioning helps and reflecting helps us understand their emotions helps so reflecting is also a process not just repeating but also putting what they are saying in the perspective of broader scriptural knowledge that we have and then if we consider that after with that if you're giving advice it's always better to give a multi level advice so that people can people don't feel uh, people don't feel that they have let down someone whom they actually respect because that can be immensely demoralizing so even if they take one step forward and they feel benefited by that then that itself encourages and inspires them that helps them move on and prabhupada also sometimes uh, told that i am giving this advice for you it's so he provided a customized advice uh, which was not necessarily the ideal but whatever was suited for that person so when during the process of giving advice it is more a matter of uh, not just giving but concluding so and preempting anticipating what obstacles they are going to face so that uh, they feel equipped to deal with the issue and then i think a major part of the talk was detachment after we give the advice that just sometimes people may not be able to follow not because they are disobedient or insubordinate sometimes they just have weakness so what was it weakness we called bhakta nandra for weakness is acceptable but hypocrisy on no, orders cheating uh, cheating is not acceptable so in that i think we discussed earlier about these four defects the first three are largely not in our control but the fourth is and if we rather, rather than blaming someone for being dishonest or cheating we may have to check whether you know we are creating an atmosphere whether where a person can be honest or we are creating an atmosphere where a person is you know is is in one sense they feel their very survival depends on covering things up so that's why guhya makhyati pruchyati and a forum for that is so important and uh, detachment also means that sometimes people may not take the advice and we need to accept that is as you said that even gurus sometimes find that disciple may not take their advice and and that also gr- reflects back to the point that giving instructions is undesirable because then that puts them people in the position of not having obeyed and overall if we are developing a relationship with people then the way of assessing the success is we have a destination but it's the important thing is the journey rather than checking how far they have come to the destination we can say how far they have come from their starting point and that can encourage them to keep moving that can also encourage us in terms of uh how much we have been able to help them and uh, to some extent we may also have to broaden our definition of success uh, to so that depends also on what is glorified within the community because whatever is the usual whatever is publicly appreciated starts becoming pra- the aspiration of individual devotees so when we learn to when we recognize the importance of coaching in due course and uh, with to a due degree then that also helps devotees to take up that as a serious service as an important responsibility but like prabhupada himself was doing that in the 1970s 1960s we could say overall and then i think the conclusion was that the relationships are what is going to sustain a person in bhakti and it is this kind of um, coaching and the connection coming from coaching that's what will create a home in people's hearts and where they find a home it's that we are not just a office or a hospital or a missionary field it's where they find the home is uh, it depends we have we could say that uh, that balance between safety and freedom or liberty so each devotee will have to find out each seeker we could say let to find out where they get the best atmosphere and with respect to selecting a guide who oh, someone who knows them some somebody who understands them cares for them and somebody who they feel can help them so and it can also be that it may also be that it's not one person who does everything one person so detachment can be also that not that the person may not obey me 
that is one aspect of detachment also means that i don't have to be the sole deliverer of the person i can take advice from others i can encourage them to take advice from others so it's like we in so we are not restricting access through coaching rather we are facilitating them to become a part of the community and there can be multiple channels for that and uh, the feedback aspect was also important if if people after they do something follow up or follow up is very helpful because that inspires and motivates them to uh, do things and also to address obstacles which may have prevented them from doing those things so so this is a very important subject and also your point that whatever be the system of devotee care it's more of matter of the individual taking responsibility to give advice in a more uh, in a more effective way and giving advices those four adjectives were most frequent most demanding most rewarding most dangerous service so yeah i think uh, we need all more reflection and more training so that the service can be done more effectively yes for any thanks you are like to add in the conclusion oh thank you i think you summarized it wonderfully and uh, i thank you chaitanya charan guru for your amazing service i am you one of your number one fans uh, and uh, my hope is that many of your podcasts will be uh, transcribed into a book i think that would be an incredible service to the vaishnav community i think through these conversations i've heard many of them uh so many beautiful points are coming and so we we thank you for doing this and hope it will be uh in a book and not lost in the uh mountain of in, uh, internet information and internet videos uh because i think it's very very valuable what you've done thank you so much prabhu thank you prabhu for sharing your time today and yes i also hope to take this knowledge in some other formats we have discussed about a little bit earlier let's see how it works out Thank you. Sure. Wonderful talking with you. Thank you, Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.